Welcome back to Yu-Gi-Oh! History with Joe Girlando. In today's video, we are returning to the summer of 2006, often referred to as Chaos Return format, and taking a look at another top-tier Chaos variant, Recruiter Chaos. One of the reasons I love the summer of 2006 is that the format seemed in many ways to be self-correcting. Now, that term means that without input from Konami or from Upper Deck at the time, it seemed as though, although Chaos Sorcerer itself was the most powerful card in the format, the types of strategies that were used to support Chaos Sorcerer evolved and in many ways corrected itself just by the player base reacting to trends in the format. So, for example, at the beginning of the format, we saw Chaos Return as the dominant deck across the board. Multiple YCS are at that time shown in Jump Championships, and heading into National Season, it was very clearly the standard prototypical Chaos variant. But as the format progressed, players trying to counteract the power of Return from the Different Dimension came up with very logical conclusions and were able to adapt Chaos versions to not only remain top tier, but to actually counteract Chaos Return. And the first deck that did a fantastic job of that was Recruiter Chaos. Now, in Yu-Gi-Oh! terminology, the term Recruiter refers to cards like Mystic Tomato, Shining Angel, and others like Pyramid Turtle that, when destroyed by battle, allow you to search your deck usually either for another copy or for a specific card. In this case, we're going to be talking about Mystic Tomato and Shining Angel tutoring out Sangin, Spirit Reaper, Dee Dee Warrior Lady, and occasionally Miss Magician of Faith. In either capacity, though, we are going to be talking about a Chaos deck that, in order to support the three copies of Chaos Sorcerer, elect to run full playsets of Mystic Tomato and Shining Angel. It wasn't entirely uncommon to see Chaos return versions with a single Mystic Tomato, but committing to the full six copies allows you to main deck cards like Creature Swap and take into consideration how difficult it is to attack through recruiter monsters, allowing you to have a game plan against return that was something that we did not primarily see early on in the format. So if you think about the perspective of the Chaos Return player, you're really hoping to use return from the different dimension with one turn either to generate a ton of card advantage or just outright win the game. But if your opponent has multiple recruiter monsters on the field, it can be very difficult to actually generate card advantage. One Mystic Tomato is in many ways three Mystic Tomatoes and then a Spirit Reaper at the very end. One Shining Angel is really three Shining Angels with DD Warrior Lady at the end. And if your opponent has been able to clog the field with recruiter monsters during the early stages of the game, in many ways it blanks any ideal and productive return from the different dimension, unless your opponent can somehow clear the way which wasn't always a guarantee. It was sometimes difficult to deal with multiple recruiter monsters, especially if the recruiter chaos player was unwilling to attack into something like Mirror Force of Sakuratsuwama. Not even to mention that most recruiter chaos decks elected to run three copies of Royal Decree, maybe with something like a Torrential or a Mirror Force as their entire trap lineup, adding a second layer of protection against return from the different dimension. So when we put the combination now of six recruiter monsters and three main deck copies of Royal Decree together, we now have this Chaos variant that's almost designed explicitly to counteract the Chaos Return variant that we talked about a couple weeks ago. And if your entire game plan revolves around utilizing Return from the different dimension and you've made deck building decisions like including Magical Merchant, three copies of Chaos Sorcerer, that's all fine. But if you run into an opponent whose game plan is to clog the field with recruiters and take advantage of a Royal Decree trap lineup, you're going to have a really difficult time sticking to your standard game plan and really is going to force the Chaos Return next to adapt as the format progressed, which is something that we're actually going to talk about in a later video because we are going to return to this format one more time in the near future and talk about a third variant of Chaos decks, but I'll leave that for the future. Regardless, today we're going to take a deep dive look at the Recruiter Chaos variants that were popular during the middle stages of the format, getting a lot of inspiration from the champion of Shonen Jump Philadelphia, Kyle Duncan, Although there were plenty of other players that also saw success piloting Recruiter Chaos to the top tables of Shonen Jumps during the summer of 2006. All right, we'll start the deck profile off with, of course, three copies of Chaos Sorcerer. Basically, every Chaos deck played the full three copies of Chaos Sorcerer, whether that was Chaos Return or today's Chaos Recruiter deck. The entire format essentially centered around utilizing Chaos Sorcerer, so we have three copies of that. We also have three copies of Cyber Dragon. Obviously one of the best light monsters at the time. It was a pseudo staple in three ofs, especially if you're running a chaos deck. And then we have two copies of Zaborg the Thunder Monarch. Really common to see at least two copies of Zaborg in most chaos decks, whether it's the return deck or the recruiter deck. Both decks really can generate a lot of field presence. This deck probably more so than the chaos return deck, but really even both decks can do so. This format has recruiter monsters. This format has set monsters like Dekoichi, Magician of Faith, Magical Merchant that you don't mind hitting. 
This deck also has six special summons in the sense of the three Chaos Sorcerers and the three Cyber Dragons, not to take into consideration Return, Premature, if you like to run it, Call the Haunted, and then Snatch Doe, which was more of a staple. So this deck actually has a lot of ways, even if you don't have Field Presence, to special summon a Zaborg, right? You go Sorcerer, Banish, Tribute for Zaborg, pretty common play. So the two copies of Zaborg, really good. And then this is what really separates this deck from what we talked about last week, or last couple weeks. So the Chaos Return deck, we're going to look at Tekoichis and Magician of Faith, Magical Merchant, a bunch of flip effects. This deck's not going to do that. This deck is instead going to run three copies of Shining Angel and three copies of Mystic Tomato. So the purpose of running these six recruiters is the sense that they're really kind of difficult to play through. What I mean by that is if you're not banishing it when it's set with no limit of cross out, and honestly, if you're running Recruiter Chaos, you typically don't set these in order to play around Nobleman of Crossout. And if your opponent's not able to banish it with Sorcerer or destroy it with Zaborg, your opponent at some point is going to have to push through these. And right, if you're not crashing into Sakuratsu armor or Mirror Forces and just leaving these in defense, that clogs the field up. If your game plan is to win the game through return from the different dimension, if your opponent has these recruiters on the field, it can be really annoying. One, because... Attacking through three Shining Angels that eventually ends with DD Warrior Lady can be really difficult, right? That's four monsters you have to push through. That's really not practical. And then the Mystic Tomatoes end up resulting in either Spear Reaper, which with Return from the Dimension is not that big of a deal, right? You can just attack over the attack position Spear Reaper and probably deal enough damage. But if you're not winning the game and they suddenly shift this to defense, now it's really annoying if your primary game plan is to win through Return. Then, of course, you also have Sang in the player can search out. These are the primary targets, technically, the Shining Angels can search out Magician of Faith, which is generally speaking not something you're going to do unless you combine that with one of the copies of Sukiyomi, really the singleton copy of Sukiyomi rather, or you have Book of Moon, both of which you only play one Sukiyomi and one Book of Moon, so it's not overwhelmingly likely that's going to happen, but it's not impossible. I've sort of, as talking about the six recruiters, have commented on some of the other monsters the deck elected to run for this Mystic Tomatoes. We have two Reapers and a Sang, and I'll say a lot of players ran three Reapers. I've elected only to run two. I feel like three Reapers is a little bit over the top. I think you only want to be able to search it out really once over the course of a game. And then if you have three, it's kind of the idea that you're going to draw it more often than you really want. I can totally understand running three, though. A lot of players did elect to run three. A lot of players had success running three. I just think two is a nice middle point between one when you don't want to draw it and then you can't search it out, and three, which is a little bit of a lot to me. And then for the light package, we have obviously Dee Warrior Lady, which was generally speaking, consider the one that you want to search out the most, and then the two Magician of Fates. Indeed, Warrior Lady is one of those cards that, with hindsight, I don't think is actually a very good card in GOAT format. Even in this format, it might not be the greatest card in the world, but if you're going to run Shining Angel, you basically have to run it, right? It's funny, too, because back in the day when people looked at their light counts, this was one of the lights they included that oftentimes never actually went to the grave. So when you were calculating lights for Black Luster Soldier, Chaos or for even way back in the day, Chaos Emperor Dragon, I always found it odd that DD Warrior Lady was there, because it only really hit the graveyard through card destruction, your opponent discarding it with Delinquent Duo or Racial Charity. But nevertheless, when we look at this particular deck at this particular time in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, we have a reasonable amount of options with the Mystic Tomatoes and the Shining Angels. Your opponent's going to have a difficult time getting through all of them if they intend on winning through return from the different dimensions. So the six of these can really clog the field up, prolong the game, and allow you sort of to incrementally build up card advantage, and then pinpoint game points where you can play, whether it's Creature Swap, pinpoint a time period where you crash, get a saying in tribute for Zaborg, do things that shift the game into your favor, really nice tempo swings. And then we have two monsters that aren't targets for any of the Mystic Tomatoes or Shining Angels, but are just two really powerful cards. Sukiyomi, obviously you have Magician of Faith, you also have Creature Swap in the deck, and then Breaker is basically a pseudo-staple. So this deck is really the big monsters that run a lot of Chaos decks, Shining Angel, Mystic Tomato targets, and then two cards that are just generically really powerful. But you'll notice there's no Dekoichis, there's no Night Assailants, this deck's not running a Morphing Jar, there's a lot of cards that you may have seen in other Chaos decks that this deck's not running. But past that, in order to support this, we have two copies of Creature Swap. Creature Swap is really fantastic because you obviously have the six recruiters. If you're not familiar, if you Creature Swap a Mystic Tomato to your opponent's side of the field, attack over it with, let's say, Breaker or Cyber Dragon, it then enables you to search your deck usually for Spirit Reaper. That's one of the reasons why Cyber Dragon is actually probably a little bit better in this deck than other decks, right? You can go, let's say your opponent goes Summon Breaker, presumably pop a back row, maybe they you know, try to pop a Chainable or something. Regardless, on your turn, you can go Summon Cyber Dragon, Summon Mystic Tomato, activate Creature Swap, and give your opponent the Mystic Tomato. And oftentimes, the monster that you swapped for is big enough to attack the Tomato, but if that's not the case, right? Let's say your opponent did not actually have a big enough monster on the field. Let's say 
they're taking over a Dekoichi in defense mode, let's say you're taking over something like a Chaos Sorcerer that you want to use to banish something, you don't actually want to use it to attack, the Cyber Dragon can then be the one to attack over the Mystic Tomato, and then you search your deck for something like Spirit Reaper, you pick out a card out of your opponent's hand, or maybe you start saying because you need to search. So Creature Swap, really fantastic card. It's probably better in this format than it was in Chaos Return, or rather in GOAT format, because there's only one copy of Scapegoats, and it wasn't even necessarily a staple. I will say, though, that if you play this, you do not have to worry about Return from the Different Dimension, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. What I mean by that is if you play Swap, your opponent could play Return, as, basically as a way of you know, fading, you know, making the Creature Swap less than desirable, right? They give you something like a saying, and they give you something that's not really going to advance your game state. But you also forced out their return, which isn't all that bad. And if you're playing swap, you're probably giving them a recruiter, which you want anyway. So when you play Creature Swap, you do need to take into consideration Call of the Haunted, Scapegoat, Return. There are ways to stymie your primary game plan, or what it is that you intend on doing with Creature Swap. But nevertheless, I still think it's a really powerful card. Obviously, when you're playing this many recruiters, you want to run it. Then we have two copies of Nobleman of Crossout, which basically is pseudo staple. Nobleman's an interesting card because when you play this specific deck, one of your primary game plans is to reduce the likelihood that Nobleman, from your opponent's perspective, actually does a lot. So a lot of times you want to summon the recruiters as opposed to set them to play around Nobleman. Now granted, you do have Magician of Faith in your deck, so it's not like your deck will never, ever, ever set. But you actually can pull it off where if you have Sukiyomi or access to Sukiyomi, you can search off the Magician of Faith off of a Shining Angel that your opponent destroyed on the previous turn. And then on your turn, play Sukiyomi, flip down the Magician of Faith, and then flip it back face up and make it so, again, your opponent never has a chance to nobleman you. So I will point that out that a lot of times, depending on the game state, depending on your array of cards, you might just summon these in order to play around nobleman. And if you're willing to set them, it's probably because you have something like Magician of Faith in your hand that you do want to set. Right? It really kind of depends on your opponent, how you feel they play Nobleman. Not everybody just Nobleman's a set monster the first time your opponent sets. So there's a lot of back and forth. That's why I love this format so much. A lot of really small decisions that have a big impact on the outcome of the game. But that is something to note. With Nobleman and the recruiters, you might not necessarily always set them. Though that does also leave you vulnerable to Chaos Sorcerer, right? So there is a discussion there to be had in both directions. But two Noblemans, basically a pseudo-staple, even if the recruiter decks themselves try to play around it. This deck elected to run two copies of Smashing Ground, so when you're running multiple Spirit Reapers, whether it's two like in my build or three like in some other builds, Smashing Ground plus Spirit Reaper is obviously really good, right? You summon the Reaper, your opponent doesn't really want a Torrential there, there's that little bit of tension, like, oh, are they going to fall and stuff with Smashing? But if I play Torrential, it's like they're discarding one of my cards anyway. You play Smashing Ground, you attack directly, obviously now your opponent can't Torrential. In addition to that, with this deck becoming more and more popular, it's not a bad idea to have cards like Smashing Ground because they can kill the Recruiter's without actually triggering their destruction effects. So Smashing Grand has some utility there. Uh, this deck can sometimes play like a little bit, such as a beatdown deck, especially with Royal Decrees, right? If your opponent sort of has a bunch of traps, especially in game one, you might have a game state where your opponent has relying a lot on one single monster that they were able to put onto the board. Now you smash and ground it and they have two or three traps and they feel like they can't get anywhere. So the Smashing Grand has a lot of utility in this particular type of deck. Then there's some one ofs There's Sort of the pseudo trinity cards of graceful charity and confiscation this deck doesn't have treebone frog in it which is sort of the third piece with graceful charity some builds elected to run it which i can understand especially with creature swap but with decrees i'm not a big fan of playing a card like treebone frog especially if you only have two monarchs in your deck but nevertheless we have those two we have snatch deal which basically is pseudo staple mst and heavy which were basically pseudo staples both limited to one we have Enemy Controller, which is useful in this deck for a couple different reasons. Same thing with Book of Moon. Because this deck is electing to run a Royal Decree Trap lineup, if you do want to have a defensive card, you usually don't want it to be a trap, right? You don't want to play Torrential, Sakurats, Armor, Mirror Force, and Three Decrees. You're going to conflict. So if you want to have any protection in your deck, any type of defensive cards, you usually want to sway towards Quick Plays. Both Book of Moon and Enemy Controller are reasonable enough defensive cards that also have utility in other conditions. So I like both of those in this deck. Book of Moon is also really good with Magician of Faith. And when you run Shining Angel, there could be game states where your opponent attacks into Shining Angel on their turn. And then on your turn, you book your Magician of Faith and then get to flip it up and get the spell recursion effect. And then one single copy of Scapegoats. There's not a lot of combos with this, right? There's Enemy Controller, which is something. There's Creature Swap, which is the big one. You don't actually play Metamorphosis, at least most of the players that ran this deck. One of the main reasons you're not running Metamorphosis is, you know, you don't have the Treeborn Frog in the deck, you don't have Magical Merchant, so 
If you run Metamorphosis, you're really confined to just Scapegoats, just Magician of Faith, and that's really kind of narrow. Right? This deck doesn't have a bunch of level 1s like some of the other decks. Granted, you could tutor out a Magician of Faith, right? You crash a Shining Angel, get a Magician of Faith, Metamorphosis. It's possible, but this deck doesn't have as much of a level 1 emphasis as the Chaos Return deck from last week. So I have the Scapegoats in there, comboing primarily with the enemy controller, the Scapegoats, and the fact that this deck doesn't actually mind having some quick plays that are at least pseudo-defensive, right? It can work as a, you know, a simple version of something like Wabaku, if your opponent's going for game, thinking that you only have decrees as back rows, and you just kind of surprise them with the Scapegoats. Also taking into consideration that this deck didn't exist in a vacuum, there were many other people that were running this deck at the time, especially as the format progressed. So having Scapegoats is also one of the best ways of counteracting your opponent's creature swap. Granted, to add even another disclaimer to that, chances are you're going to side out Creature Swap in the mirror map, so that's only a game one thing. But maybe it's early in the game, your opponent doesn't necessarily know you're running the Recruiter version, they play Creature Swap, you hit them with the Scapegoats, and now you at least invalidated that Creature Swap. In terms of the trap lineup, very simple. We have the one copy of Mirror Force. A lot of people elect to trend Mirror Force. I think it's one of those cards that at this point in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, it's so powerful, it's so memorable, it's so iconic that people, generally speaking, didn't cut it. It's also not bad against the mirror match, right? One of the best ways of dealing with Shining Angels and Mystic Tomatoes when your opponent attacks with it. They may assume that your back row is one of your Royal Decrees and as a result get the Mirror Force to trigger because it's an unexpected back row. But after the Mirror Force, we have three copies of Royal Decree. So again, this deck in many ways was designed and catered to counteract Chaos Return. Chaos Return was winning because Return from the Different Dimension is such an overwhelmingly powerful card, so how are we going to counteract it? We're going to clog the board with recruiters that are difficult to get through, at least all in one swing, so it makes it so that Return doesn't necessarily end the game, and we're just going to play Royal Decree. So you can draw all the returns that you want, we're going to play Royal Decree. Typically decks play MST, Heavy Storm, Breaker, so they are three Decrees and three primary back row destruction effects, at least in Game 1, making it so that Royal Decree oftentimes would stick in Game 1, and honestly, if you're willing to play a deck with three decrees, you're also willing to set it and accept the reality that occasionally your opponent's going to draw MST and Heavy and make it so that it's obviously detrimental to your game plan. You know, sometimes you'll set Decree and Book of Moon. If they have Heavy, they have Heavy. That just is what it is. It's a long tournament. That probably will only happen once. As a result, you get to really sway your deck into the favor, sway your deck into the you know pendulum swinging into running these decrees, which counteracts arguably the most powerful card in the format, which was Return for the Different Dimension. So three roll decrees for that purpose. The extra deck's really simple. This deck technically can't access it, barring something like creature swapping a Cyberstein. So I really just put together sort of the generics, right? You want the good level fives. You want some lower levels. I mean, really, you have no you know, primary way of accessing any of these. It's really under the unique circumstance of you getting access to a Cyberstein by creature swapping or snatch stealing from your opponent. So you do want to sort of the generics. These were basically all the generic top tier fusion monsters during the time, right? You have the Cyber Package, Blue Eyes Ultimates. You didn't even there and need Master of Oz, but I did have it there. You want, obviously, Ojama King can sometimes win games, King Dragoon. Sometimes you need to clear your opponent's graveyard. You know, Thousand Eyes Restrict was limited to one, pretty good. Last Warrior can sometimes steal a game, so you just need the generic ones. This deck doesn't have Metamorphosis, doesn't play Cyberstein, so this is sort of an afterthought, but I did put together a small extra deck. From that point on, in terms of talking about the side deck, let's talk about the top decks of the time. You obviously had sort of the good stuff decks that have existed for a large portion of Yu-Gi-Oh's history, which I'm just going to represent with a couple of generic Warrior monsters. You had the Dark World decks, whether it was full Dark World or whether it was just pieces of a Dark World engine. You had OTK decks. I'm using Royal Magical Library to represent an array of them from the Royal Magical Library Tundo OTK to even ones like Reversal Quiz. You had Monarch decks, whether it was a full commit to a Monarch deck or sort of splashed with chaos. You had this deck's worst nightmare, which was the Banisher of the Radiance Kaiku Chaos deck. So that's the next deck that we're going to profile in this format. This was the worst matchup. This was a nightmare matchup for your deck. We'll talk about that in just a moment. You obviously had Chaos Return. I'm going to represent a Mystic Tomato for the Mirror Match. And then you have some sort of Cyberstein decks, whether that was Full Stein, whether that was Stein plus Stall, whether that was a Burn variant that sided in the Cyberstein or vice versa. There was a variety of Cyberstein sort of alternate win condition decks. How are you going to counteract this? Well, this is sort of one of those points in you guys' history where there's not all these theme decks that have silver bullets. So your side deck's kind of generic, but I have a few cards that have specific uses. So we have Dust Wombat for any burn strategies, which you could theoretically run into. You have your own copy of Banisher of the Radiance. So I put two Banisher of the Radiance here for the mirror match specifically. It's sort of obvious, but if your opponent has Mystic Tomatoes and Shining Angels on the field, 
the best way of breaking that is to attack over them with Banners of the Radiance, or at least establish a field where you can attack over multiple recruiters with Banners of the Radiance, and now obviously none of their effects trigger. That's just absolutely positively game-breaking to pull that off, especially when you're playing against a deck whose primary defense is Book of Moon and Enemy Controller, meaning only one of those two actually deals with Banners of the Radiance, Book of Moon. Enemy Controller can shift this to defense, but it's not like Banisher itself has to be the monster that attacks over a recruiter. If you had a Cyber Dragon on the field, that can still that can still attack over a recruiter. So Banisher the Radiance was a really, really tough card for this specific type of Chaos deck to deal with. And as a result, we're going to embrace them and actually put them into our side for the mirror match. Then we have two copies of Mobius. I love Mobius in the side deck of these decks. I love the idea of pinpointing Chaos, pinpointing chaos Return as a matchup where you really want to pick off those return for the different dimensions. It also has utility in some other matchups. I will say, because this deck mains Royal Decree, it might not be as necessary as some of the other decks that are profiled, but I still put two copies there. Then this is a little bit of a debate. You can go a few different directions. So if you play against the Banish of the Radiance version of Chaos Return, which I'll talk about in the next deck profile, I think it's important to have some package in your side deck where you can shave some of the recruiters and swap them in with something else. So I've elected to go with the Apprentice engine. Apprentice Magician still triggers when it's banished. It just has to be destroyed by battle. So if your opponent goes banish or attack a face down, assuming it's Mystic Tomato or Shining Angel, and they hit Apprentice Magician, it's still going to trigger, and then you have the ability to search either the second Apprentice Magician, Old Vindictive Magician, or Magician of Faith, which Magician of Faith might not be that good if Banisher's been on the field since turn one, but nevertheless, you at least have an Old Vindictive Magician to search. And that's a pretty good way of stymieing the Banisher of the Radiance package. You also could totally side deck in instead Gravekeeper Spy. I think either package is reasonable. You could even convince me to side deck all six of these and then just totally take out the entire Recruiter package. That way when your opponent sides in Banisher or main decks Banisher, we'll talk about that, you've basically blanked them with your side deck plan. And the deck that main decked Banishers, main decked multiple Banishers and multiple Kaiku the Ghost Destroyers. And if your opponent's primary game plan is to back up their Chaos Sorcerers with two beatdowns, right, right, two beat sticks, at least in their perception, from their perception, Banisher the Radiance and Kaiku, and you've sided in Spies and Apprentice, well, you're in a much better position because those two monsters don't really do anything to Spies and Apprentice Magician. So you might be able to counteract their primary game plan from the side deck, which I think would have been really valuable. So... I at least have these three. You could convince me to even bump it up to more. From that point on, there's just a couple sort of one ofs Azure Priest is another piece to the puzzle in terms of siding against the mirror match, right? Azure Priest can just go through all the Mystic Tomatoes, all the Shining Angels. You don't really mind if you go attack three Shining Angels, attack into DD Warrior Lady with your Azure Priest. That's a pretty reasonable transaction for you. Yes, you're fueling their lights in the grave, so it's not the best, but it's not the worst. It is a way of clearing. And if they have Tomato and they have Shining Angel on the field, you can go attack all the Shining Angels, leave them at the DD Warrior Lady, attack into the Tomato, clear out as much of that as they're willing to go, and then attack the DD Warrior Lady with the Azure Priest. You are no doubt fueling their Chaos Sorcerer for the rest of the game, but you did potentially clear a little bit of the field, which may have otherwise stalled the game out for a long time. Kribo is there for Cyberstein. You could even put more than one Kribo. I just have one here as sort of a Sangin target. This deck doesn't necessarily need a ton of them. Granted, your opponent could just open the Stein OTK with Megamorph turn one, and maybe you wish you had two. But with Mystic Tomato, you can search Sangin, you can crash, get Karibo, you can get access to it a little bit easier than typical cast deck, so I elected only to put one. I have two copies of Wabaku too. That's sort of the other way of hedging against the, K the Cyber Stein OTK, having at least three pieces of interruption. And then games can go long, so I put a Ceasefire. I had a Ceasefire in the Chaos Return deck. I think there's a variety of you know, burn cards, per se, that might be pretty good. Even, honestly, with Wabaku and Karibo, if you're getting close to time and you're going into Game 3, you have some reasonable pieces to kind of you know, steal a win, right? Ceasefire, Wabaku, Karibo, these are ways that your opponent might not necessarily anticipate that their life points can either be reduced or make it so that you can't necessarily have your life points reduced. But regardless, this is a look at a Chaos Recruiter deck from the summer of 2006. Thank you for watching. Check back soon for plenty more Yu-Gi-Oh! content.